I'm sorry it has to end this way, brother. No, you're not. Improving the final Agni Kai is impossible. That used to be my opinion, and it's likely one that you share, but very recently, something changed my mind. I realized that what I once thought was perfection could actually be refined with one simple idea. You added a rainbow. Is that okay? <sighs> Zuko and Azula's last scene together is nearly perfect. Their fight stole the show, becoming the emotional climax of Avatar and feeling exponentially more meaningful than Aang's earth-shattering battle with the Fire Lord. This poignant scene, this tragic culmination of a sibling rivalry pushed far past its breaking point, leaves the audience feeling raw. And while a lesser show might have turned this royal clash over a throne into just another fast-paced spectacle, Avatar's writers understood the assignment. They knew that no matter the outcome of this fight, it shouldn't be a moment of celebration. This event should haunt both characters forever, and this striking animation, juxtaposed by the somber soundtrack, are a testament to just how much work went into pulling off this nearly perfect scene. Ah, but there's that pesky word again, nearly. Nearly perfect. To describe this, I mean, who gave me the right? It feels like I'm criticizing the brush strokes on the Mona Lisa, but that should tell you just how transformative my recent discovery was. A few weeks ago, I came across a video on Reddit submitted by the user No Vanity Shorts. The post, titled Zuko vs. Azula, both Rainbow Fire, was self explanatory, simple, and it changed everything. For me, seeing these clips clicked everything into place. It was suddenly very obvious that there was one thing, one missed opportunity even that could have enhanced this already iconic scene to an even more profound status. Imagine for a moment how breathtaking it would have been had Zuko started bending Dragonfire. Imagine if this conflict, blue versus red, sister versus brother, had been transformed into blue versus the full spectrum of the rainbow. Imagine the look that would have been on Azula's face had she learned that less than 1% of my viewers were subscribed, and that the 99.1% of you that aren't could change that right now with the simple click of a button. Press subscribe. To be fair, the idea of rainbow firebending isn't exactly unique within the fandom. The thought that Zuko might have learned how to bend multicolored flames has long been bounced around in the deepest depths of Avatar discussion posts. Personally, I never took the idea very seriously. It always sounded a bit too much like fanfiction run amok. Similar to how some people are convinced that earthbenders could bend the carbon atoms and bones. Like, yeah, that sounds super cool, but come on guys, just let's be serious. Yet still, I understand why the idea of rainbow fire resonates with so many hardcore fans. There's arguably only a single scene in Avatar that is more iconic than the final Agni Kai, and it's Aang and Zuko's dance with the dragons. Season 3's introduction of the Dragon Masters Ran and Shaw was an awesome addition to the franchise. I mean, they're motherfucking dragons, and they created the most beautiful pillar of fire ever depicted in animation. How could you watch this and not walk away feeling a combination of unbridled hype and inspiration? But despite all that, and despite how mind blowing the dancing dragon sequence was, it Loki didn't amount to very much, which is kind of a hot take, so let me explain. The whole point of the Firebending Masters episode was for Aang and Zuko to learn cool new firebending techniques. For those who need a little refresher, after he switched sides and joined Team Avatar, Zuko's bending was severely weakened since he no longer had the passionate anger that he'd previously been using to fuel his firebending. Essentially, Zuko was having some performance issues. He couldn't get it up, or I mean he couldn't get it big and hot, or uh, it's just okay. After several reigns of brutal, power-obsessed, and warmongering fire lords, the philosophy behind firebending had severely been tainted. Fire, which had originally represented an in life was now synonymous with death and destruction, and during the war, firebenders learned to weaponize their hatred as a way to strengthen their bending. But that had always been a bastardization of the art form, and a few true enlightened masters like Iroh and Zhang Zhang still practiced bending in the original way, focusing on the breath and being driven by their true inner purpose. The thing is though, we never actually see that much of a difference between the two firebending philosophies. Just look at Iroh and Ozai. They're both masters on the opposite ends of the spectrum 
spectrum, yet their skills seem pretty comparable. I would even argue that Ozai's looks a little bit bigger if we're comparing sizes, and we most definitely are. The exact same thing could be said of Azula and Zuko, who also represent the opposing viewpoints, especially after Zuko's little dance. It doesn't seem like learning from the dragons gave Zuko any new skills. He just kind of discovered a new path to get back to where he was before. The only reason that Zuko suddenly decided he could take on his sister was because he realized that Azula was mentally unstable. It had absolutely nothing to do with the dragons. And it's not a coincidence that the only time Zuko was curb stomped by Azula was immediately after Mei and Tylee betrayed her, which was, of course, the start of Azula's spiral. You would think that learning from the original masters, or at least that practicing the quote unquote true form of firebending would give Zuko and Iroh some kind of advantage over their adversaries, but it just doesn't. The only tangible outcome of the Dancing Dragon episode, the most visually spectacular scene in the entire show, is that Zuko stops grunting when he firebends. And that's literally it. Before the episode, Zuko let out a every time he threw a punch, but then after, he's all calm and collected. And yeah, I still think this is a cool detail. It subtly shows how Zuko's new style differs from his old one. But you know what? Now I've decided that I didn't want subtlety. What I wanted, what I think we all wanted deep down was this. Like, come on, that's just so good. Shout out No Vanity Shorts for letting me use these clips. They're pretty spectacular. And amazingly enough, things are about to get even better because up until now, I've actually been keeping a secret and it's a rather important one, so I'm gonna come clean. What I've been talking about in this video, the concept of Zuko being able to bend multicolor fire is actually canon. Seven years ago in 2015, Smoke and Shadow Part 1 was published. This comic trilogy was the fourth entry in the Avatar graphic novel series and it is all about Fire Lord Zuko and Azula and the continuation of their struggle for power. The story is pretty standard as far as Avatar comics go, and I'll dive more into that in the future, but for today's video, the overarching plot is almost completely irrelevant. So why did I bring this up? Well, because in this comic, Smoke and Shadow Part 1, there is kind of randomly a singular panel that depicts Zuko bending rainbow fire. Let me set the scene for you. It happens right at the beginning of the story, when Zuko is on his way back to the Fire Nation, having just found his previously missing mother. Ursa, it turns out, wasn't killed, and instead she was banished to the Earth Kingdom. There, she created a new identity, changed her face, wiped her memory, and started a new family with her former fiancé. The person that she would have married were not for Ozai. So Ursa, her husband, husband and their daughter Ki were all traveling with Zuko when suddenly their travel carriage was attacked by the new Ozai society. They're a group of political extremists led by Mei's dad, and their goal is to put Ozai back on the throne by assassinating Zuko. During the fight, a spear flies through the carriage and just barely misses Ursa, so now Zuko is really pissed. And then this happens. Bidding, isn't it? The imposter fire lord. Meets his end in a roaring fire! <coughs> Let him have it, through Ozai society! Ha ha! New Ozai society! This is your last chance! Surrender now, or face your Fire Lord's wrath! You saw that, right? Those streaks of green and purple accenting Zuko's fire tornado? I suppose they are somewhat understated, especially when compared to the unmistakability of Azula's blue flames, but there is definitely some rainbow action happening in this image. And even in the subsequent panels, you can still make out the faint traces of colors, so this is intentional. Oh, and by the way, that amazing animation and voice dub that I just played were exclusively made courtesy of the Avatar Book 4 Restoration Project. You may remember that I talked about them a few months ago. They're a group of professional voice actors, musicians, animators, and comic artists who are working together to bring the Avatar comics to life. They just dropped their first episode, and honestly, it's pretty remarkable. These are canon comics that pick up right where the original show ended, and in my opinion, this is now hands down the best way to experience the continuation of Aang's story. Hey guys! Ah, no, nothing! We're not doing anything out here! Haven't you ever heard of knocking, Sokka? First of all, you're supposed to knock before you go inside, not before you go 
outside! So check out their channel to catch the full episodes, link below. But back to the bombshell I just dropped. This scene offers irrefutable evidence that Zuko can at will create dragon fire. Right? This scene comes directly from the comics, and the comics are all canon, right? I mean, right? Well, yes, I can assure you that the comics are canon. I'll admit that I'm still not quite sure how to feel about this moment in particular. It's just such an outlier when compared to everything that surrounds it. The scene is never mentioned or even referenced again. And in the few other fights that follow this, Zuko's fire is always back to being basic bitch butterscotch without a hint of other hues. To me, it always made more sense to interpret this moment as an inspired artistic decision and not as a scene with lasting ramifications for the Avatar universe. Which I know is a bit of a cop out since I'm literally ignoring ignoring evidence now just because I don't like it. And it's an ironic cop out too. I started this video saying that I didn't like Rainbow Fire because it sounded like fan fiction, and now I'm saying that it's technically canon, yet I still don't like it. It's frustrating, I know, and please share your thoughts in the comments below too. But while you're down there typing, keep playing this video because I'm about to tell you my solution that would have made way more sense in universe while also making the show's finale that much more spectacular. My biggest problem with the current canonical status of Rainbow Fire bending that Zuko can sometimes do when he's angry, I guess, is that it completely goes against the traditional firebending philosophy that was preached by the Sun Warriors. It's like a little heartbeat. Fire is life, not just destruction. Surrender now or face your Fire Lord's wrath! Yeah, something tells me that Zuko's wrath is much more analogous with destruction than with life. Additionally, Zuko just randomly being able to pull this off whenever he feels like flexing on his haters really just ends up diluting the entire idea's impact. The concept of colorful bending has always been about spectacle. It's about wowing the audience with something truly unexpected. But the thing is, this only works when the spectacle hits are in small doses. It needs to be rare, and it needs to have specific in-universe constraints that prevent it from being overused. Think about the Avatar state which is another visually striking display that's used to heighten moments of the show. If Aang just started glowing in every other scene, then each time the Avatar state was used, it would feel less and less special. And Avatar's writers knew this, which is why at the very beginning of the show, they established an in-universe reason to limit its use. And then they restricted it even further at the end of season 2, when they temporarily killed Aang and locked off his access to the Avatar state entirely. They avoided showing off one of their coolest ideas for nearly the entire season, also that this moment in the finale would hit like an absolute freight train. So if we wanted to reintroduce the concept of bending dragon's fire into the Avatar universe, then there's a fine balance that we must strike. Our proposal must ensure that rainbow fire bending has natural limitations, but those limitations can't be too strict because we must also leave space for exhilarating dramatic moments when contextually appropriate. As a first step, I think it makes sense to briefly go over the few other instances of uniquely colored fire in the Avatar world. As far as I'm aware, there have only been five examples of this across all of canon, and they are Azula's Blue Flames, Ran and Shaw's Rainbow Fire, Zuko's Polychrome Pillar from the comics, the ominous green fireplace in Long Fang's office, and Rangi's Jet of White Flames that she used against the false Avatar Yoon. By now, those first three should have been pretty familiar to everyone, but since we haven't talked specifically about Azula's fire yet, let's quickly cover why she has the exclusive ability to bend in blue. Honestly, this section deserves a spot in the Avatar FAQ. Every fan has wondered this before because besides Besides some throwaway lines here and there, the uniqueness of Azula's bending is barely ever addressed on screen. Between the blue blazes and the chilling motif, the show always makes sure to make Azula's presence known, and it's this attention to detail that actually clues us into the secrets of Azula's abilities. In real life, the color of a flame communicates two key aspects about the ongoing combustion. The first is how hot that part of the fire is, and the second concerns which chemical compounds are being burned. A typical orange fire burns at around 1000 degrees Celsius. Yellow flames are about 200 degrees hotter, while deep red flames have lower temperatures, maxing out around 800. White flames clock in above yellow ones at about 1500 degrees Celsius. And then we reach Azula's specialty, the Indigo Inferno. Blue fire can reach temperatures of 1650 degrees Celsius, or 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that Azula's punches are scorching 60% hotter than everyone else's. And that is why Azula's fire is blue. She's both an utter perfectionist in her craft, and she's an immensely gifted firebender. We saw that when Azula 
was a kid, her fire blast was still standard Sorbus. That means orange. So we know that her blue bending wasn't a genetic gift. No, she worked for this. Azula is so precise and has such great attention to detail that she's mastered it, to the point where this accomplishment has become Azula's default despite it being unthinkable to most other fire masters. And you can never catch Azula slipping, even when mentally she is. However, there still is a bit of genetic tomfoolery that's helping this nepotistic princess out. Her lineage includes both the raw power of Fire Lord Sozin and of Avatar Roku. Azula's talents are quite literally the stuff of prophecy. The main reason that Fire Lord Ozai forced Ursa to marry him in the first place was because the Fire Sages told him that their bloodlines would produce powerful prodigies. So moral of the story, eugenics is kind of awesome. Actually, let's scratch that, and let's move on to the green fire in Longfang's lair. This one is much easier to explain. Apparently, the color green appearing in a fire has zero bearings on its temperature. Instead, green is only an indicator of the elements being burned, in this case, probably copper. So this green fireplace could be blazing at any temperature. There's no way to tell. All it tells us is that the Dai Li really know how to set a vibe. On to the final case of uniquely colored combustions in Avatar Canon, Rangi's white fire blast. This is a much deeper cut. For those who don't know, Rangi was Avatar Kyoshi's girlfriend and firebending sensei roughly 400 years before the events of the show. Do me a favor and picture Azula, but replace her conniving nature with a mischievous one, and then also replace Azula's desire to dominate others with a desire to protect Kyoshi. And now you've basically got Rangi. They're both extremely determined, and talented, and proud, and they even attended the same high school. So when Rangi shoots a blindingly white blaze to protect her girlfriend from their mortal enemy, it honestly doesn't feel too too out of place. Upon her third pulsing, charging breath, she lunged, releasing a flame so intense it nearly turned from yellow to white. It was pure avenging wrath given solidity. White fire, if you recall, is a single step beneath blue, so this is likely where Azula's genetics are giving her an upper hand. Another noteworthy part of this scene is that pulling this off wasn't exactly effortless for Rangi. She sort of had to power up by completely dropping her guard and taking three deliberately deep breaths to funnel her inner flame. That fact, combined with the line, pure avenging wrath given solidity, makes these white flames a lot less jarring for me than Zuko's modeled tornado scene from the comics. Rangi is clearly using a thought out technique. With her three deep charging breaths, she's harnessing traditional firebending teaching, those of the dragons and of Uncle Iroh. But then she also leverages contemporary firebending using her righteous rage to fuel her flames. And I do think that the righteousness of Rangi's wrath is an essential distinction. I should probably share that only a few pages before this fight, the man Rangi is currently trying to disintegrate stabbed her mother in the throat with an earth spike. And this man, Yoon, was once Rangi's best friend. So Rangi isn't fighting with hate-filled bigotry like Ozai or Sozin would have. Rather, she's fighting for impassioned honor, honoring her commitment to defend Kyoshi as both her girlfriend and as the Avatar's bodyguard, and then also honoring to avenge her own mother. That's the difference. And for me, this perfect balancing of the opposing philosophies is why I actually think Rangi's white flames complement the established lore rather than contradicting it. Oh, and if you couldn't already tell, the Kyoshi books are beautiful, brutal, and everyone should go read them. But now for my proposal, how can we retroactively add rainbow firebending into Avatar in a way that's both smart and consistent, yet still spectacular. I'm envisioning three simple rules. The rules of rainbow firebending. Rule one is that a rainbow firebender must have been trained by a dragon. Rule two is that the bender must be a master of traditional firebending principles. And then rule three, and this is the most important one, is that rainbow firebending can only occur during Sozin's comment. That is it. Those are all the constraints necessary to make this idea work. So let me tell you exactly why these guidelines would have made Avatar even more incredible. I feel like the first rule is pretty easy to get behind. If you want to be able to bend a dragon's fire, then you have to have seen the real thing at least once. Like, come on, that just makes sense. If Zuko had been tossing around rainbows when we first met him, we can all agree that that would have been stupid, right? Right. Okay, in my proposal, even the most skilled or genetically inbred firebenders would never be able to learn this technique exclusively through hard work and dedication. Learning the dragon dance from a dragon should be a core component of rainbow firebending. Even though the colors of Ran and Shaw's fire are breathtaking, I can't be the only one who feels like Aang and Zuko experienced it on a personal level that's indescribable to anyone else, including us in the audience. They judged you. 
and gave you visions of the meaning of firebending. I think those visions that the Sun Warrior Chief spoke of should have had a more tangible impact, and that a personal encounter with a Master Dragon should be necessary if anyone ever wishes to produce those same colors. That rule alone substantially narrows down the list of potential rainbow firebenders, which is a good thing because keeping the ability rare is the entire point of these constraints. But now we're faced with a good question, who exactly does still qualify, and how many characters even know about the Dancing Dragon? dragon form. Right off the bat, I hope we can all name at least two characters, Aang and Zuko. If that wasn't immediately clear to you, then you must be so high on cactus juice right now that I can only imagine how great your trip has been seeing all these colorful and vivid fire clips. But that aside, what other contenders do we know of? Well, the only other person who we've actually seen do the dance was Avatar 1. Not only was he the first ever Avatar, but he was also the first ever firebending master, and the first ever champion of traditional firebending philosophy. That's why Wan's bending was so much stronger than that of the other untrained humans, even though they all received the same gift from the lion turtles. And since the avatar state is the amalgamation of each of the past lives, knowledge, and experiences, I would argue that Wan seeing the dragon's vision means that every single avatar after him also qualifies, but only when they access the avatar state's power. We of course know that Uncle Iroh did the dragon dance at some point too, as he was previously the last outsider to be deemed worthy by Ran and Shaw. Another interesting consideration could be general Iroh II, Zuko's grandson. We know that Zuko's companion dragon Druk has been with him since his 20s. It's not too much of a stretch to think that the royal family members might have had some dancing sessions over the years. Heck, maybe even Korra did a dance or two as part of her prestigious and holistic avatar training. So that could mean that she qualifies even without the avatar state. In fact, we know from the avatar cookbook, which is canon, that during his reign, Zuko made the dancing dragon form mandatory in Fire Nation schools. So feasibly, every single firebender in the Legend of Korra might qualify, which is why according to me, myself, and I, none of those should count because simply learning the dance without having the accompanying visions means that the training is incomplete. Reminder that I quite literally made up these rules, so I get the final say on this. For one final bit of speculation though, I think it's a fun idea to think that the Sun Warrior Chief is the only member of the tribe to be blessed with Ran and Shaw's vision. Now I know there is zero evidence to back this, but these people clearly appreciate a good ritual, and I think that having this pivotal experience being the main thing that distinguishes the chief from the other warriors makes slightly more sense than believing that it's an ordinary routine for everyone. Plus, it would help to explain why Ham Gao was so butthurt when Aang and Zuko survived. He might have just been jealous. Next, let's dive into rule two. The dragon flame wielder must be a master of traditional firebending principles. This rule establishes dragon firebending as an advanced firebending technique. I don't think simply learning the dragon dance form, visions and all, should be enough to automatically unlock this ability. That's too much of a cheat code. Like, suppose a six-year-old learned the dance and was deemed worthy. Should all of their fiery blasts from then on be effortlessly multicolored in the same vein as Azula's? No, obviously not. That wouldn't make too much sense. And I think the same should be true for any novice firebender, like Aang, for example. Up to the point of learning the dance, Aang had only controlled fire like twice before in his entire life. To me, it would just be illogical for anyone, even the prodigy last airbender, to jump straight from beginner to rainbow firebending beast after only one chance dragon encounter. So rules one and two work together to form a solid baseline criterion. Yes, you have to have done the dance with a dragon, but you are also required to put in some hard work yourself and master the fundamentals. Rule two also acts as a blocker for any new age firebenders who rely on hatred as a crutch for power. The language stipulates that the bender must be a master of traditional firebending and not just any old variety. This deliberately excludes Fire Lord Sozin as a candidate. In my opinion, if you have done a genocide, then you do not deserve the power of rainbow. Theoretically, Sozin could have done the dance with his own evil dragon, but with this constraint, that wouldn't even matter. Ultimately, Rule 2 dictates that the polychromatic firebender must be an active practitioner of traditional firebending philosophy. So someone couldn't, say, find the lost civilization and learn the secrets of firebending, but then go right back to being a war general who writes letters to his family, laughing about burning a city to the ground in an iridescent inferno. <coughs> Uncle Iro. Oops. So if your purpose isn't true, the rainbow fire is not for you. And now we've reached the final step of BLT's rules for rainbow firebending. Requirement number three is Sozin's comment. This is where things get really good because I'm about to share how these suggestions would have made Avatar's finale at least 3.7 times better. This third rule is pretty self-explanatory. Firebenders can only generate vibrant multicolored flames once every 100 years during the advent of Sozin's comment. In my opinion, the comment was one of the best things to ever happen to Avatar. It's introduced 
production in episode 8 immediately gave the show a much needed sense of urgency, giving the gang only a few months to prepare before they'd have to face Armageddon. You know how we all share those same unspoken feelings about the first few episodes of season 1? That they're not as polished or as funny and that generally they just feel a lot more like an aimless kids show. Well, do you want to know the one thing that elevated the stakes and changed the show's entire trajectory? It was Sozin's comment. It is true that most shows take some time to find their footing, and in Avatar's case, the second they landed on Sozin's comment, it was game on. Not only did each season now have a definitive goal, master the elements as quickly as possible, but the comment also provided an excellent backdrop for the penultimate episodes. By season 3, the gang had gotten so good that everyday firebenders were little more than cannon fodder. To keep the stakes high, something needed to change, and establishing an in-universe reason for the finale's firebenders to be exponentially more powerful was quite simply a genius move. From nearly the beginning, we were told that Sozin's comment would lead to more fire. Under my proposal, not only should there have been more fire, but there should have been more colorful fire as well. I think the best way to explain the final rule's significance is to walk through Avatar's finale and understand exactly which moments might have been impacted by rainbow fire. The finale is made up of four distinct concurrent events. They are 1. Sokka leading the attack on the airships, 2. The White Lotus's liberation of Ba Sing Se, 3. Zuko and Azula's final Agni Kai, and then 4. Aang vs Ozai. By following my three simple guidelines, Rainbow Fire could have enhanced them all. Let's first demonstrate with the main event, the Avatar vs the Fire Lord. For those paying attention, you should realize that the first half of this fight would go exactly as it did before. Yes, Aang learned the Dragon Dance and fulfills rule number 1. And yes, he also practices traditional firebending, which is in line with rule 2. Yet, Aang does not completely satisfy the second requirement, because in his own words, he is far from being a master firebender. So following a few clashes, Aang will still end up on the defensive as the common enhanced Fire Lord's power quickly overwhelms the young avatar. He will still avoid and evade before desperately seeking shelter in an earthbent cocoon. And then Ozai will still mock the genocide of the air nomads and will still force Aang to fly backwards into a pointy rock. The change comes the second Aang enters the Avatar state. Individually, Aang still may be a novice, but when united with his past lives, he's mastered firebending 10,000 times before. And with Sozin's comet blazing across the horizon, the scene is now set for the spectacle of rainbow firebending to take hold. It's important to note that this should only be a visual change. In fact, spoiler alert, my proposal for each part of the finale is to just add rainbow fire effects on top of what was already happening. I don't want to change any of the outcomes, and I don't even think any additional lines of dialogue would be necessary. One thing that I've always loved about Avatar is that they respect their audience's intelligence, so they wouldn't need to hold the viewer's hand for my changes either. Seeing this and thinking back to the dancing dragon scenes from only a few episodes prior is a pretty straightforward connection to make. And although it's probably unlikely that the viewers would pick up on the exact same rules of rainbow firebending that I established, I think they would get the gist of it. Aang is now a master, both of the fire element and of the Avatar state. Plus, the comet is probably causing some weird stuff to happen as well. Moving over to the White Lotus's mission in Ba Sing Se. Although it would be pretty cool to see Zhang Zhang erecting massive multicolored walls of flames, that unfortunately won't be the case. Zhang Zhang is a master of traditional firebending, but he has yet to experience the dragon's dance. So he does not qualify, and those walls shall remain orange. But they did look pretty cool, right? This section of the finale is all about Iroh, and the ironic fulfillment of his destiny to take back Ba Sing Se. Of course, in terms of potential places to showcase the rainbow, we have this incredible moment when the Dragon of the West finally offers a glimpse of his legendary fire power. Even though seeing this blast in the full spectrum of color would have been amazing, I actually think there's a more poignant moment in the Ba Sing Se scenes that could have been further enhanced by Dragon Fire. Despite being one of the main and most formidable characters, you might have noticed that Iroh barely ever firebends throughout the entire series. When he does rarely spark a blaze, it's normally only for a few fleeting moments, like when he demonstrated his fire breath against Azula or held back the Dai Li so that Katara could escape with Aang's body. Come to think of it, the Dragon of the West was truly a master of neutral gen, so it's honestly befitting of his character that Iroh only firebends twice in the entire finale. That's right, only two times. And I've already crossed one out, so what is the second occurrence that I think would be a worthier benefactor of Rainbow 
fire. In this arc's final moment, while the rest of the Ode Masters make easy work of the city's occupiers, Grand Lotus Iroh stands alone and away from the battle. This is exactly where Iroh always envisioned he'd be, where his destiny had foretold he'd be, facing the gates of the Earth Kingdom's royal palace. But something feels off, because the defiant insignia of the Earth Kingdom's people is hidden from view, covering it is the symbol of Iroh's own Fire Nation. In my interpretation of this scene, it is only now, in this moment, that Iroh internally feels that he himself is worthy of redemption. Ba Sing Se was the site of Iroh's greatest failure. These people, who Iroh is now freeing from an unjust occupation, killed his son, Luton. The Earth Kingdom made Iroh experience an unfathomable amount of pain, the death of one's only child. But Iroh kind of deserved it, because he was the aggressor, his son was the aggressor. They killed Luton in self-defense. Luton died a monster, and that's on Iroh and he knows it. That's why Iroh was so generous to the Earth Kingdom citizens throughout season 2, and why the dam of emotions finally burst during the tales of Ba Sing Se. Iroh lost his son for no reason other than his own self-righteous ego. An ego he inherited from his grandfather Sozin and that was propped up by the Fire Nation at large. Empathy and humility are the opposite of ego, and they are the most notable traits embodied by Iroh since the series premiere. The Earth Earth Kingdom wronged Uncle Iroh, but at a time when the general himself was on the wrong path. By taking this small step, by removing this stain of his nation's legacy with an uninspiredly simple flame, Iroh completes his own redemption arc and finally lets go of his lingering guilt. It is in this scene that Iroh's inner fire burns the brightest with renewed purpose, and it is here I think that the addition of Rainbow Fire could have the most impacts, marking the culmination of Iroh's path towards righteousness with a slight augmentation to that final liberating blaze. I don't have much to say about the airships part of the finale, it quite honestly has almost nothing to do with Rainbow Fire. I guess an unspoken rule zero is that these rules are only relevant for firebenders, so neither Toph, Suki, nor Sokka qualify. But these guys do have a front row seat to Aang's fight with Ozai, so I'm sure Sokka would have some creative ways to describe Aang's kaleidoscopic display. Also, shout out to the English Dictionary for some of these deep cuts. Someone rewatch this video and take a shot every time I use a new word for the word rainbow. But don't rewind it just yet because we've nearly reached home plate. Let's improve the final Agni Kai. I bet you could guess how this might go down. Zuko, who meets every requirement for rainbow firebending, is about to flex on his sister, making her signature blue flames look dull in comparison. Hardcore and casual fans alike have long praised this fight's striking animation and inspired choreography. This scene's music, the drama, it is all already so good, like 10 out of 10 execution. I'm just adding but a small splash of color. For the dragon fire to hit the hardest in this final Agni Kai, I actually don't think it should be present at the start of the fight. There's just something about that initial clash, the equal amounts of orange and blue meeting in the middle, I do want to preserve at least some of that iconic red versus blue imagery. Besides, I think that about halfway through the fight, there is actually a more elegant opportunity to introduce the rainbow flames. Did you hear the roar of that inferno? It almost sounded like a dragon itself. If there were ever a moment that necessitated multicolor fire, then it would have to be this punch. Just look at this shot of Azula's eyes, showing shock yet maybe also a hint of wonder. The so-called prodigy princess who can't help but admire the beauty of this previously unknown form of firebending, and the look on her face upon learning that little Zuzu has finally bested her in the only way that she's ever deemed to be important power. It's almost like this moment was tailor-made for the rainbow edit. The other reason that I gravitated to this punch specifically is that I really, really like the intentional deep breath that Zuko takes before his strike. It reminds me a lot of the breathing routine that Rangi did before unleashing her own blindingly white blaze. And when juxtaposed with Azula being uncharacteristically out of breath, I think this is a great way to even further highlight the differences between the fire bending philosophies. With these visual changes, all four parts of the 
the finale would now be tied together with shared yet distinct moments centering the same phenomenon. As they currently stand, each plotline of the finale is great, but admittedly they are very self-contained. Ba Sing Se's liberation has literally no connection to Aang's fight with Ozai, but by having the emergence of multicolored dragon fire as a through line in each narrative, I think that the finale as a whole would be strengthened. And it helps of course that rainbow firebending will always look pretty freaking cool. I think the best part of rule 3 is that it keeps the spectacle of rainbow fire contained within these 4 scenes. Well, 5. Once Sozin's comet is gone, that's it, no more colorful flames for the next 100 years. It wouldn't need to be considered every time Zuko bends in the comics. It wouldn't impact the Legend of Korra at all. It wouldn't need to factor into the upcoming movies or shows or anything else. It would just make Avatar's finale way cooler and then it goes away. Perhaps during the return of the comments 100 years later, it would be pretty wholesome if Rainbow Firebending was much more widespread due to the influence of Fire Lord Zuko's reign. But I digress. Finally, here is some rainbow lightning bending because why not? I would love to hear from you all in the comments. What do you think of this idea? Maybe give your answer in two parts. One, do you think that rainbow fire bending should have been or could potentially be included in Avatar's lore? And two, do you think I succeeded in making the final Agni Kai and Avatar's finale just a little bit better? Or am I a failure? Hit subscribe if you're still watching, share this video with someone who loves Avatar, and then click here to learn about about Aang's life as an Instagram influencer. I'll see you in the next one. Baby Lion Turtle. Baby Lion Turtle. Baby Lion Turtle.